Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning. Welcome to Faith Bridge. We are so glad that you are with us today, whether you're at the Klein campus or if you are up at the Woodlands or if you're coming to us online, we're glad that you've chosen to worship at Faith Bridge today. We're continuing on in our sermon series that we are calling Overcome, and we're also continuing our journey through the book of First Peter. We're going to be today in First Peter chapter 5. If you have your Bible, please go ahead and open and turn there. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. That could be yours to keep if you need one. Please consider that our gift to you. So a couple of months ago, the book club that I am a part of read a fascinating account of the construction of the Panama Canal, one of the great engineering marvels of all time. The title of the book is The Path Between the Seas, written by David McCullough. Now, if you've ever read anything by McCullough, you know that it is a very well-researched, well-written book, just full of all kinds of interesting bits of data and history and statistics. One of the more startling bits of history that I learned was that uh, the Panama Canal had an unbelievable death toll associated with its construction. Construction was begun in the year 1881 by the French. Americans finished it in 1914, but during that 33-year period, over 30,000 people lost their lives building that thing. Even more interesting was that of that 30,000, 25,000 did not die from some sort of industrial accident, but rather from either yellow fever or malaria. Now, that is uh, particularly ironic and sad because a full 30 years before construction was ever begun, in the year 1850, one Dr. Josiah Clark Knott postulated that yellow fever and malaria were actually spread by mosquitoes. But the medical establishment of the day thought that was ridiculous. Everybody knew, after all, that the way you contracted malaria and yellow fever was by inhaling noxious fumes, poisonous gases that just happened to be prevalent in swampy areas. And so the the treatment that was prescribed at that time was to somehow get rid of the noxious fumes. How they intended to do that, I have no idea. But it wasn't until 1904 that science finally caught up and agreed, yes, mosquitoes are the culprit, and changed the treatment plan. And once they started to go after the mosquitoes, the death rate dropped precipitously. Yellow fever and malaria practically disappeared for the remainder of the construction period. But not before 25,000 men and women lost their lives. Improper treatment can have devastating consequences, both in the medical world and in our spiritual lives as well. If we don't come at a problem as we should, there can be a huge price to pay. Now, Christ followers regularly deal with all sorts of issues and challenges, difficulties and struggles. That's what this whole sermon series has been about, overcome. One struggle in particular, I think, stands above the rest. Uh, Typically, I think, is to be found at almost epidemic levels. It is no respecter of persons. It goes after men and women alike, the rich and the poor, the young and the old, Any of us are susceptible to it, and left untreated, this particular malady can destroy our lives. What I'm talking about, of course, is worry. Worry. That uh, niggling little noise there in the back of our minds that won't go away, that issue, that concern that just seems to overwhelm us at times. Like a disease... 
it can attach itself to our souls and literally just draw the life right out of us, taking away things that make life worth living, things like peace, confidence, joy, hope, the ability to enjoy the present, to anticipate the future, to enjoy life in general. Worry can take all of that away. And I have to think that in a crowd this size, in all of our locations, whether you're here at Klein or in the Woodlands or online, I'm inclined to think that probably many, many of us came to church today carrying some kind of worry. And for some of us, maybe a lot of us, it's a worry that is big enough that it has prevented us from really engaging with God this morning. We've missed out on worship. We've missed out on the opportunity to worship Him, to love Him, to hear from Him, to receive from Him, all because we have been consumed with worry. Now, because that is so often the case, if you'll permit me for just a moment, I'm going to take off my preacher hat and put on my pastor hat. Because Pastor Ken and I want you to know that as your uh, under-shepherds, those who are appointed to care for this congregation, we are very much aware of the struggles, the difficulties that... uh, many of you are going through. Right off the top of my head, I can think of any number of people right now who are um, concerned because of plunging oil prices and their job is on the line. There are people in our church who are struggling with life and death medical issues. There are families that are being torn apart. There's relational issues between husband and wife, between parent and child, and the list goes on and on and on. Pastor Ken and I want you to know that we care about you, that we are praying for you as you turn in those connect cards. And we're also praying that the message today will be um, a blessing to you. It will be an encouragement to you and that God's word will speak to you with power and with wisdom so that together we can begin to address this challenge called worry. As I said, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5, looking at just two verses, verses 6 and 7. I'm reading from the English Standard Version this morning. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the gift of your word, for its ability to speak into our lives with truth and with power. We pray now that our hearts would be open to receive all that you have for us today and that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher just as you promised. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. As any good physician will tell you, and certainly as the Panama Canal debacle illustrates so aptly, before one can administer an effective treatment plan, there must first be an accurate diagnosis. We have to know what the problem is before we can begin to address it and have any hopes whatsoever of success. And the same is true with this thing called worry. Now, generally speaking, worries can be divided into two rather broad categories. Certainly, it's true that there are millions of individual things that we can all worry about, but all of those individual things, I think, can generally be put into these two broad categories. On the one hand, you have those worries that we bring upon ourselves, those times that we run ahead of God that we take matters into our own hands, that we try to fix what we feel like God isn't fixing sufficiently or on our calendar. And as a result of our meddling with it, our trying to get in there and do what only God can do, we just ratchet the worry factor right on up the scale. That's one big category of worry. 
The other, actually, I think is much more common, much more widespread, and that's not worry as a result of anything that we have done, but rather, these are things that just happen to us. It simply comes with living in a broken, fallen, sinful, messed up world. Things come along that we never asked for, they certainly never hoped for, never anticipated, but boom, there they are. What are we going to do when these things come out of nowhere? How are we going to respond to that worry? Those are the two big categories of worry that we want to talk about. And Peter, in these two verses, provides for us the perfect treatment plan for each one. So not only do we want to look at these categories, but we want to see what does God's Word have to say about the effective treatment for each of them. So let's start with those worries that we bring upon ourselves. If there's anything that we human beings are good at, it's the ability to create our own problems. We are masters at going where we should not go, doing what we should not do, and making a bad situation even worse. When Becky and I were first married, we decided that it would be prudent for us to draw up a will. And so we contacted a lawyer, and he agreed to do that for us. And in our meeting with him, he said, uh, here's here's how we're going to move forward. The execution of this will obviously is going to impact the lives of of many people, but a handful of them in particular. And, And they need to come in here and sign this will to agree to the stipulations of the will. So this is what I want us to do. I want us to find a time where all concerned parties can come together, sign off on it, and it'll be good. We're like, great, sounds like a plan. Well, a week went by, two weeks went by, sneaking up on three weeks, and I, and I knew that I was not high on the pecking order, you know, just a simple little will, getting around to it when he could. But I was concerned. I I, I wanted this thing done. So I decided that I was just going to do the lawyer a big favor. And I took that document and went myself to all of the concerned parties and got them to sign on the dotted line and took it back to the lawyer thinking that he would just be pleased as punch that I had taken the initiative to do this. In fact, he was mad. I mean... He was angry. It was like, Dan, why did you do that? You know, there are reasons why we were going to do it the way I said we were going to do it. Legal reasons. And, and now that you've gone off here half-cocked, just doing what you wanted to do, we're going to have to start over. And that's going to mean more time, and that is going to mean more money. Well... I, uh, I was not real excited about going home and telling <laughs> Becky that I had managed to incur greater costs. You might say I was just a little worried about that situation. Yeah, we can run ahead of God. We can get so concerned, so worried about things that we just sort of take it into our hands and we're going to make it right. But you know, those kinds of worries, in fact, are a form of pride, a very subtle form of pride, of self-sufficiency. In essence, we're saying to God, I don't know if you can or that you even want to take care of this concern that I have, so I'll just take that. And while off the top of my head, I don't know what I'm going to do about it either, there is one thing that I can do and I can worry about it. And I can spend a lot of time worrying about it. And nothing gets better and nothing gets fixed, but things don't go well. And despite the fact that life has taught us over and over and over that we don't have the capacity to fix our lives, that we're not omnipotent, all-powerful like God, we are not omniscient, all-knowing like God, our motives are mixed That really doesn't slow us down sometimes from just taking matters into our own hands and making things worse than they needed to be. 
So what is the treatment for this kind of worrying situation where we really have no one to blame but ourselves? We know that we've created the worrying circumstances. Well, the treatment is found right there in verse 6. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Step back and simply say to him, Father, I blew it. I thought more of myself than I should have. I thought more of my abilities than I should have. And really, the only thing for me to do in this moment is to come before you and say, I'm sorry. And here's the good news God is not a lawyer, there won't be an extra bill. God is going to be glad to receive us back. God is going to be thrilled that we've decided to get back on his schedule so that at the proper time, he can do what only he can do. And we can receive his blessings. We can receive his wisdom. Best of all, we can put those worries to bed because we are no longer involved. How about you? Is the worry that's uh, with you today in church a a worry of your own making? Well, if it is, there's good news. Humble yourself. Just be willing to say, you know what? I messed up, Lord. And the forgiveness will be there and the restoration will be there. And best of all, God himself will be there to step in and do what only God can do. So one big area of worry that we have are those situations that we create. But as I said earlier, the much bigger and the much more common source of worry are those things that we really had nothing to do with. We didn't want, we didn't ask for, but bam, there they are. The tests come back from the lab and the news is not good. The economy takes a nosedive and suddenly we find ourselves wondering about our ability to provide for our family. Our children are making choices that will have some difficult consequences. Our parents are getting older and their needs are increasing and we love them and we care about them but we've got our own family to care for as well. How are we going to make it? And on and on the list goes. Life has a way of coming at us like that. What are we going to do? Well, the treatment for this kind of worry is found in verse 7, and that is to cast your cares, your anxieties upon the Lord. Literally, to throw them at Him. Why? Because He cares for you. It's not just that he can do something about them, it's that he wants you to throw them his way because he loves you. He cares about you. He's concerned with your life and with your circumstances. And so it is with confidence that we can cast our cares upon God. The promise, the hope is right there in black and white. And yet for some strange reason, you and I are so reluctant to do that. There is this bizarre, twisted security that we have in holding on to these things. If we let go of it, who knows what's going to happen? At least as long as we've got it, I'm holding on to it and I know where it is. Why is it that we're afraid? You know, we entrust our bodies to human physicians. We entrust our children to teachers For their education, we entrust our cars and our computers and other possessions to to people whose names we don't even know to repair them and look after them. But when it comes to the deepest concerns of our lives, we are scared to death to entrust them to our loving Heavenly Father. Why? When I was in high school, I worked for my older brother. He was the superintendent of a steel fabrication shop, and uh, my job was basically the shop gopher, errand boy, janitor, just whatever kind of needed to be done. 
And one of my responsibilities was to uh, patrol the shop floor. It was about the size of a basketball court and pick up the trash and the debris that accumulated throughout the day. This, of course, was back in the day of glass Coke bottles, no plastic. Back in the dark ages of the mid-70s, it was all glass. And one day I was walking through the shop and noticed right there was a glass Coke bottle. So I picked it up and turned to walk to the dumpster and deposit it, which was about 20, 25 feet away, when I saw standing right next to the dumpster a, a coworker of mine. His name was Terry. And Terry saw me coming, saw what I was doing, and to save me a few steps, he put his hands out like this and, you know, kind of shook them and said, hey, here. I thought, great. Whoosh, gave that thing a fling as soon as it left my hands. He got the biggest grin on his face turned on his heel and walked in the other direction. Pow! That thing hit the floor like a bomb into a million. You know, everybody looks up. What on earth happened? There I stand like a perfect idiot. <laughs> oh, I was just Dan throwing glass bottles again. <laughs> he did not save me any steps. He increased my workload. I had to get a broom and a dustpan, clean that big mess up. You know, I think one of the reasons we are reluctant to cast our cares upon God is uh, deep down inside, we're afraid that as soon as those things leave our hands, He's just going to turn on His heel and walk in the other direction. We're not absolutely sure that He's going to be there. And so just to play it safe, let's just keep these things here. Yeah, it's making me miserable, and no, I can't do anything about it, but whew, seems a lot safer than giving it a toss. Those of you that have been around here for a while uh, may remember an occasion in my life, the life of my family, where uh, we were put to the test in this regard given an opportunity to, to practice what I preach. It was about 12 years ago. Uh, our oldest daughter, Georgia, was uh, around five or six years old. And uh, back then, she was a happy little girl with long brown hair down to her waist. And part of our regular morning routine was to brush out those tresses that had become tangled in the night, get her ready for school or for church, wherever we were going. One day, uh, Becky was taking care of that chore, and I was in another part of the house, when suddenly I heard Becky call my name, and I could tell by the tone of her voice, uh, something was wrong, something was bad wrong. And so I ran to where they were and came around the corner just in time to see Becky gently laying Georgie down on the ground. She passed out. I said, what happened? And Becky said, I'm not sure, I'm just brushing her hair, and all of a sudden her knees buckled, and I could tell she was fainting. Well, if it had been a, a one-off event, we might not have given it another thought, but over the next week or so, it happened again and again, to the point that we finally decided, okay, we, we need to go get this checked out. So we went to, to the pediatrician, who said what we needed to do was to have an MRI, uh, of her brain, which we were, of course, eager to do. But unfortunately, um, it was going to be four days before we could get on the schedule to get the MRI. And those four days, they were the longest days of my life. My mind ran in a million different directions about what could be or what might be, and every scenario was worse than the one before. Nighttime was the worst. You wake up in the night, and it's dark, and you can't do anything except just lie there and fret and worry. The other rough time was, was driving. Mind is, is free just to go all over the place, and mine did. On the day before the MRI, I was sitting in my truck over on Spring Cypress at the rail crossing there. 
of waiting for a long, slow train to finally get by. And in that moment, I reached my, my breaking point. I mean, I, I just could not deal with it. And I literally cried out to God, please, please, don't let there be anything wrong with my baby girl. And for a few moments, there was complete silence. Nothing but the regular thump, thump rhythm of those steel wheels rolling by in front of me. But then into that silence came a still small voice. And he said to me, Dan, who do you think you are? And I said, I, I'm a scared daddy. He said, Dan, you are a thief. You've taken what does not belong to you, what is rightfully mine. This situation with Georgia is mine. And for that matter, Georgia is mine. I created her, and I love her more than you ever will. To say that I was humbled in that moment would be an incredible understatement. I was humiliated. I was embarrassed. <laughs> because you see, in a flash, I realized I did not want to cast my Georgie upon the Lord because I was just sure he was going to walk away and she was going to fall in a million pieces on the floor. One of the most freeing things I have ever done was to pull into the gas station right there near the crossing and to repent of my lack of faith, my lack of trust, and then literally with my hands to take them off of the steering wheel and in prayer literally cast Georgie upon the Lord. And I was able to do it because he was reminding me, you can cast your cares my way because I care for you. I had been blinded by my lack of trust and my lack of faith, but in the moment I handed her over a flood of memories came to me of the hundreds of ways in the past that he had proven himself to be true. Well, we went on the next day and had the MRI, and thanks be to God, everything was okay. There was nothing for us to worry about. And we actually learned something in the process. The, uh, the neurologist was talking to us, and he said, by the way, uh, just... Perchance, did you just happen to be brushing her hair when these fainting spells happened? Okay. Yes, we were. He said, it's interesting. There's an increasing uh, amount of literature out there uh, associated with this phenomenon. Apparently, there's something about the tug of the brush on the scalp that creates some sort of overstimulation, and the brain just says, okay, I'm checking out for a minute. Brushing your hair can make you faint. Who knew? <laughs> well, even, even as I tell you that story, I am keenly aware that there are people here today and your story didn't have a good ending. You've suffered. Some of you have lost loved ones even after you thought you had cast them their way. Does that mean that God does not care for you? No, it does not mean that. As Christ followers, we believe that God is working all things together for good. He is redeeming this broken world. He's working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. 
And the greatest proof that I have that God cares for me and that he is busy at the work of redemption is the cross. In just a couple of weeks, we're going to celebrate yet again with millions of believers around the world the last week of Jesus' life. And remember how on the last night of his earthly life, he wrestled mightily with God to the point that he sweat drops of blood. And ultimately, Jesus was able to cast his care upon his father. But he didn't get back what he wanted. What he got back was the cross. And he accepted it. And by all outward appearance, it would seem that that was the most uncaring thing God could have done. But in fact, three days later, it proved to be the most caring thing that God has ever done. Because of the cross, you and I not only have the proof that God cares for us, but we have the proof that God has reached down into the brokenness of this world and of our lives and that he is busy redeeming and reclaiming and reshaping this broken world and our broken lives for his purposes. We have the proof that he's offering to us a new start and a new life and an opportunity to spend all of eternity with him in a place where there are no more cares and struggles and worries. I can't begin to adequately explain to you or anyone else the fullness of the sovereign will of God. But I can tell you this. The cross tells me he loves me. And it tells you that he loves you. And it gives you permission. It begs you, in fact, to take whatever your care, whatever your concern is, and cast it upon him. Because the cross is big enough and wide enough to take it all. Just a moment, I'm gonna pray for us. And when I finish praying, the band will come out and, and begin to play. I want you then to know that the altar area is open. And this is a day when you can bring whatever it is you brought with you and leave it here with him. Don't walk back out into the world lugging what you never were meant to lug around. God's waiting for you here. Desperate, really to take from you what is rightfully his. So please, take advantage of this time, just these few minutes you have out of your day to come be with him and give to him what is rightfully his. Will you pray with me? Father, we confess to you that far too often we think more highly of ourselves than we should. We try to manage our own affairs. We try to fix things that are unfixable from a human standpoint. So this morning, we humble ourselves before you and say that we're sorry. We confess to you that in times when life has uh, ambushed us, we've wanted to hold on to those worries and concerns because we've been afraid afraid to give them to you, afraid of what you might do. Lord, forgive us, heal us, and give us grace to hand these things over to you, to literally, God, cast them in your direction, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that the cross proves you care. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day.
Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Pastor Dan, who just talked about overcoming worry, part of our Overcome series. Welcome, Pastor Dan. Thanks. Glad to have you back. It's good to be here. Certainly a very moving and relevant sermon today. Great. Um, affected a lot of people. I know, as you said, probably everyone walked in today mm -hmm. with something on their hearts sure. that they're worried about or concerned about in their lives. And um, a great time of prayer for that. And we had quite a few questions come in okay. um, around dealing with worry. Um, so we'll just jump right into a few of those. Okay. Um, what are some practical ways? Um, we talked about um, the heart behind casting our cares upon God and really trusting Him mm -hmm. with those things. Um, but what are ways that we can keep from taking those things back? What are practical things to do when we feel ourselves beginning to worry? Sure. Well, um, I think the first thing that I would say is don't be concerned that you have taken it back because inevitably you will. Everybody, <laughs> unless it is just the most minor of issues, most people do a sort of a give and take with God and, and, and that's okay as long as you're still giving it back to Him. But uh, along the lines of practicality, these are the things that I have found helpful. Uh, quiet time. And by that, I don't necessarily mean a devotional, but simply a time away from all input, you know, phones, TV, kids, whatever, to clearly think through what it is you're dealing with and perhaps even write it down. Uh, I have found many times that simply identifying what the issue is takes a little bit of the sting out of it just to know, okay, this, this is what I'm, I'm praying about. And then, of course, to, to follow through with concerted effort at prayer as often as you need to throughout the day. I also like to keep a journal to keep track of how I'm feeling from day to day. Uh, am I hyper concerned today? Well, then, okay, why? What, what possibly happened? And by simply putting thoughts down on paper and walking through this slowly rather than the thoughts coming and going at will and never really uh, embracing the issue, if you will, I, I think making that journey more methodically is a very good thing to do. Hmm, that's good. Um, so how do you balance um, casting your cares, giving them all to the Lord, and then deciding what effort or action is required mm -hmm. for you on your part? Right. I suppose one of the uh, fallacies that someone could take from that particular verse or from my message is that all we have to do is cast it and we're done. God's got it. Um, that's not the case. Uh, rarely, if ever, does God completely remove us from the equation and deal with it independently. Uh, no, it, it's our issue. It's our concern. So we are still going to be involved in it. Um, I think first you have to consciously think about how, okay, I'm not going to own this. It's with me, but it is not mine. And if you have to go through the physical motion like I did in my pickup truck, great. But then after that, uh, these are the things that you can ask God for in the midst. Uh, grace for strength, just to make it day to day. I, I have counseled with many people who have told me it was uh, an effort just to get out of bed. So grace for strength to deal with it. Wisdom to know how to deal with it in a godly manner. Pray for the mind of Christ so that you know the decisions I'm making, the actions that I'm taking are... Uh, in keeping with what He would have me do, in keeping with God's Word. I think another helpful thing is to walk through your problems in community because so often an outside voice is a good one. When you're all wrapped up in something, it's impossible to be objective about it and think clearly in a, a small group member or a serve team member or a fellow church member sometimes can just bring a tremendous word of clarity that helps us to keep moving forward. And we say in our small groups that we're there to share 
burdens. Yeah, real with people, each other, real life. Real people, real life to yeah. help carry some of those things that we struggle with. Absolutely. Um, so how do you know though if you if worry if you're struggling with something that you're worried with and you are casting it to the Lord and you are doing these things, how do you know if maybe there's a deeper problem, if maybe you are struggling with an anxiety disorder mm -hmm. or what encouragement do you have there or wisdom there? Okay. Well, I, I think one way to discern between what you might call normal worry and an anxiety disorder would have to do with the frequency of the worry and the uh, uh, breadth of the worry. For example, if an individual finds out that they have a serious disease and they are intensely worried about it, well, that's no cause for concern that there might be an anxiety disorder. That, that's pretty typical, pretty normal. On the other hand, if someone wakes up and finds out that they're worried about going to work that day, and then when they get in their car, they're worried about the drive, and then when they get to work, they're worried about whether or not this bill is paid, you know, and just all throughout the day, it's item after item after item after item, uh, that's probably a pretty good sign that there's something else going on here. Another thing to consider is, is the worry becoming debilitating? Are, are you unable to function? Has it rendered you uh, unable to do your job, to interact with your family, to meet your basic responsibilities? If you suspect a disorder is a part of the situation, then go to your doctor, uh, go to a counselor, go talk to someone who's had some training in these matters who can look at it more objectively, more carefully than you can and, and get their input. That's good. That's good. Um, I know you talked today about um, just the prayer that we offer here. And mm -hmm. I know we do the healing prayers now and just every week encouraging yeah. people to come and seek prayer mm -hmm. for the things that they're going through. Sure. And certainly appreciate the pastor hat this, that you were putting on today and just reminding everyone that they're not alone in the things that they're going through. Yeah, they don't have to be. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. That's true. Well, thank you so much for your message today. You bet. Um, and thank you for being here on Postscript. Mm -hmm. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.